This episode of Community Sanctorum is part one of our focus on Augustine. In one of the greatest compositions of the early church fathers titled Confessions, Augustine of Hippo wrote these words, quote, Late have I loved you, O beauty, so ancient and so new. Late have I loved you. You were within while I was without. I sought you out there. Unlovely, I rushed heedlessly among the lovely things you made. You were with me, but I was not with you. These things kept me far from you, even though they'd not even be unless you made them. You called and cried aloud and opened my deafness. You gleamed and shined and chased away my blindness. You breathed fragrant odors and I drew breath. And now I pant for you. I tasted and now I hunger and thirst. You touched me and I burned for your peace. We're now gonna turn to the life and work of a man of singular importance in the history of the church due largely to his impact on theology. I'll be blunt to say what seems many, maybe most, are careful to avoid when it comes to Augustine. While the vast majority of historians laud him, a smaller group are less enthused with him, as I suspect will become clear (laughs) as we review the man and his impact. Augustine is the climax of patristic thought, or at least in the Latin world. By patristics, I'm referring to the theology of the Church Fathers. If you've ever had a chance to look through collections of books on theology or church history, you've likely seen a massive set of tomes called the Anti- and Post-Nicene Fathers. That simply refers to the Church Fathers that came before the Council of Nicaea, Anti, and those who came after, Post, and helped lay the doctrinal foundation of the Church. Augustine was the dominant influence on the medieval European church, so much so that he's referred to as the architect of the Middle Ages. Augustine continues to be a major influence among Roman Catholics for his theology on the church and sacraments, and for Protestants in his work of theology on salvation. Augustine's backstory is well known because there's plenty of source material for us to draw from. Some say that we know more about Augustine than any other figure of the ancient world because not only do we have a record of his daily activities from one of his students, Bishop Posidius of Kalama, a city like Augustine's, uh, a city like Augustine's Hippo on the north coast of Africa, what today is known as Algeria. But we also have a highly detailed record of Augustine's inner life from his classic work, Confessions, that I just read a quote from. And then there's a work titled Retractions, where Augustine chronicles his intellectual development as he lists 95 of his works, explains why they were written, and the changes that he had made to them over time. We're going to begin with a background to Augustine's world. The end of the persecution of the first two centuries was a great relief to the church. No doubt, the reported conversion of the Emperor Constantine seemed a dream come true. The Apostle Paul told the followers of Christ to pray for the king and all those in authority. And so the report of the emperor's conversion was a cause of great rejoicing. It was likely only a handful of the wise who sensed a call to caution in what this new relationship between church and state would mean and the perils that it might bring. During the fourth century, churches grew more rapidly than ever, but not all those who joined did so with pure motives. With persecution now behind them, some joined the church to hedge their bets and add just one more deity to the long list they already held. Others joined thinking that it would advantage their social status, now that being a Christian could earn them points with officials. Some serious Christians witnessed the moral and spiritual dumbing down of the faith and fled to the wilderness to pursue an ascetic lifestyle as a hermit or into a monastery as a monk but most just remained in their cities and towns to witness the growing affiliation between the church and earthly institutions. The invisible, universal, or Catholic church began increasingly to be associated with human forms and social structures. Now I want to pause to make sure that we all understand what the word Catholic means. It simply means universal. Historically, the era of church history that we're looking at is called the age of Catholic Christianity, not Roman Catholic Christianity. Historians refer to this time as Catholic to differentiate it from the several aberrant and heretical groups that had split off. Groups like the Arians and the Manichaeans, the Gnostics, the Apollinarians, and a half dozen other hard-to-pronounce groups. (laughs) 
But toward the end of the fourth century, the institutional replaced the communal aspects of the faith. The gospel was supplanted by dogma and rituals in many churches. Jesus had made it clear that following him meant a call to serve, not to be served. Christians are servants. They serve God by serving one another in the world. During the first three centuries, when the church was battered, the call to serve was valued as a priority. The heroes of the faith served by offering themselves in the ultimate sense with their very lives. But when the heavy hand of imperial persecution was lifted, and the church rose out of the catacombs to enter positions of social influence and power during the fourth century, being a servant lost priority. Church leaders who'd led by serving for 300 years began to position themselves to be served. Servant leaders became leaders of servants. That transformation escalated with the disintegration of the Western Empire during the fourth and fifth centuries. As invaders pressed in from the north and the east, the civil authorities fled from the frontiers and people began looking more and more to bishops and church leaders to provide guidance and governance. We've already seen how the church and the bishop at Rome emerged not only as a religious leader, but a political leader as well. The fall and the sack of Rome by the Vandals in 410 rocked the empire, leaving people profoundly shaken. One man emerged from this time to help deal with their confusion and anxiety over the future. Augustine was born in 354 in Tagaste, a small commercial city in North Africa. His father, Patricius, was a pagan and a member of the ruling local class. His mother, Monica, was a committed Christian. Though far from wealthy, Augustine's parents were determined that he would have the very best education possible. So after attending primary school in Tagaste, he went to Carthage for his secondary education. And it was there, at the age of 17, that he took a mistress with whom he lived for 13 years and by whom he had a son named Adiodatus. While that seems scandalous, we should realize that it was not all uncommon for young men of the upper classes to have such an arrangement. Augustine seems to have had a genuine love for this woman, though he fails to give us her name. It's certain that he did love their son. Though Augustine loved his woman friend, he later wrote, throughout these years, he was continually hammered by sexual temptation and often despaired of ever overcoming it. Augustine pursued studies in general philosophy, picking no specific school as the focus of his attention. When he was 19, he read how, when he was 19, he read the now lost to us Tortentius by the Roman order Cicero, and was convinced by it that he should make the pursuit of truth his life's aim. But his noble quest battled with what he now felt was a degrading desire towards immorality. For moral assistance, he resisted this downward pull by defaulting to the faith of his mother's home and turned to the Bible. But being a lover of classical Latin, the translations that he read seemed crude and unsophisticated and so held no appeal to him. What did appeal to Augustine was the Manichaeans with whom he'd already done a bit of dabbling. And by way of review, Mani was a teacher in Persia in the mid-third century who had mashed a Gnostic-flavored religion together with the ancient Persian ideas as embodied in their religion of Zoroastrianism. Augustine was an intellectual, the kind of person that Manichaeanism really appealed to. They disdained faith, claiming that they were intellectual gatekeepers of reason and logic. They explained the world in terms of darkness and light. Light and spirit were good, darkness in the physical world were evil. The uh, key to overcoming sin was to just say no. <laughs> Augustine was told that if he just employed total abstinence from physical pleasure, he would do well. He was a Manichaean for nine years until he saw its logical inconsistencies and ended up forsaking it. Now, his record of this time reveals that while he remained within their ranks, he had problems all along. Assuming that he just needed to learn more to clear up the problems, the more he studied, the more problems popped up. When he voiced his concerns, other Manichaeans told him, if he could just hear the teaching of Faustus, all his concerns would dissolve. Faustus was supposed to be the consummate Manichaean who had all the answers. Well, Faustus eventually arrived and Augustine listened in expectation that everything he doubted would evaporate like dew in the morning sun. And that's not what happened. On the contrary, Augustine said that while Faustus was eloquent of speech, his words were like a fancy plate holding rotten meat. <laughs> he sounded good, 
but void of content. Gustin spent time with Faustus trying to work through his difficulties, but the more he heard, the more he realized the man was clueless. So much for Manichaeanism being the gatekeepers of reason. At the age of just 20, Augustine began teaching. His friends recognized his intellectual genius and encouraged him to move to Rome. In 382, closing in on the age of 30, he and his mother, Monica, moved to the capital where he began teaching. As often happens when someone's religious or philosophical house is blown over like a stack of cards, Augustine's disappointment with Manichaeanism led to a period of disenchantment and skepticism. Remember, he'd given himself to the pursuit of truth and had assumed for several years that Mani had found it. Now he knew he hadn't. Once bitten, twice shy works for philosophy as well as romance. Augustine was rescued from his growing skepticism by Neoplatonism and the works of Plotinus, who fanned to flame his smoldering spark of longing for the truth. In 384, Augustine was hired as a professor of rhetoric at the University of Milan, where his now widowed mother and some other friends joined him. More out of professional courtesy as a professor of rhetoric than anything else, Augustine went to hear Milan's Bishop Ambrose preach. Augustine was surprised at Ambrose's eloquence. It's not like this was his first time in church. He'd attended churches in North Africa while growing up there, but he'd never heard anyone speak like this. Ambrose showed Augustine that the Christian faith, far from being crude and unsophisticated, was both eloquent and intelligent. An elder named Simplicanus, an elder named Simplicianus, made Augustine his personal project. He gave Augustine a copy of Geom. <clears throat> an elder named Simplic. <clears throat> An elder named Simplicianus made Augustine his personal project. He gave Augustine a copy of a commentary on Paul by Marius Victorinus, who'd converted from Neoplatonism to Christianity about 30 years before. Being a, Neoplaton Plat <clears throat> Being a Neoplatonist himself, Augustine went through something of an intellectual conversion, if not an outright spiritual transformation. Now, Augustine's future was bright. He had a prestigious job, committed friends, wealth, influence. He was still young and healthy, but inwardly, he was miserable. His mother, Monica, suggested what he needed was a normal family. She was against his long time but illicit affair with his mistress, the mother of his son. That mistress had followed him on his various moves to Tagaste from Carthage, to Rome, then Milan. Monica told... Uh, uh, <clears throat> Monica told Augustine that his woman friend was keeping him from finding a suitable wife, someone more fit for his social standing. Though, August, though Augustine loved her, his mother's constant urging to put her away prevailed, and so he ended their relationship. He then proposed to a young woman of wealth, Augustine's future was bright. He had a prestigious job, committed friends, wealth, influence. He was still young and healthy, but inwardly he was miserable. His mother Monica suggested that he needed a normal family. She had been against his long time but illicit affair with his mistress, the mother of his son. That woman had followed him on his various moves, to Tagaste from Carthage, to Rome, then Milan. But Monica told Augustine that his woman friend was keeping him from finding a suitable wife, someone more fit for his social standing. Though Augustine loved her, his mother's constant urging to put her away prevailed, and so he ended their relationship. He then quickly proposed to a young woman of wealth in society. The problem was she was too young to marry till a much later date. That date was set, but Augustine couldn't master his lust. So only a short time after breaking up with his mistress, he found another. From Augustine's own account of his struggle in the Confessions, we might describe his problem as a sexual addiction. His inner battle between the higher call of virtue and the lower pull toward vice threatened to tear him apart in a mental breakdown. It was then, as he devoured material in his quest for truth, that he heard of Christian hermits like Anthony of Egypt who'd mastered their fleshly desires. Their example shamed Augustine. 
Until then, he'd considered Christians as intellectually inferior, and yet they were able to accomplish a victory over sin he'd been powerless to attain. He began to wonder if maybe Christianity possessed a power that he'd missed. Conversion became for Augustine, as it was for so many at that time, not so much an issue of faith as action. He, persuade, he was persuaded of the intellectual strength of Christianity. He just didn't want to give up his sin, though he knew he should. One day in 386, while walking in the garden of his house, his, one day in 386, while walking in the garden of his house, his soul, seething in confusion and moral anguish, he carried a Bible, hoping to draw some guidance from it. He could make no sense of it, so he dropped it on a bench, began pacing back and forth, his mind in torment. From somewhere nearby, he heard a child's voice calling out the line of what must have been a game, though Augustine didn't know what it was. The voice said, Tali Leggy, take up and read. So he reached down and picked up the Bible that he just dropped. The page fell open to the Apostle Paul's letter to the church at Rome, and his eyes fell on words that perfectly suited his current mindset. He read, quote, Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the lust of the flesh to fulfill its lusts. Unquote. Augustine later wrote, As I read those words instantly, it was as if the light of peace poured into my heart and all the shades of doubt departed. The following Easter, Augustine and his son Adiodatus were baptized by Bishop Ambrose. A few months later, Augustine returned to North Africa. On the way, his mother Monica died, and not long after he returned to Dagaste, his son also passed. Augustine lost interest in living. Augustine lost interest in living and longed to leave the world that he once had lived for. His friends rallied around him and gave him a purpose to carry on. They formed a monastic community out of which would come the famous Augustinian order and rule. While Augustine would likely have been content to live out his life in the monastery, the North African church desperately needed a leader with his gifts. In 391, the church at Hippo ordained him as one of their priests. He did the preaching because their bishop was Greek and couldn't speak neither Latin nor the local Punic. He became co-bishop four years later, and then a year after that, sole bishop at Hippo. He served in that capacity for the next 33 years. He kept up the monastic life throughout his tenure as Bishop at Hippo. His was an extremely busy career, divided between study, writing, and the general oversight of church affairs. Now, we're going to pick it up at this point in our next episode as we consider some of his more important writings, and then we'll get into Augustine's career as a theologian. <music>